Let me close uh, this slide that is in my face because I was trying to chat with you and I just understood now how to chat on this Zoom. Which is <laughs> no worries. Okay, well, just give me a second. I turn off this light. Sure. <laughs> Net as wide. Okay, better. I had you Perfect. The now, first, uh, I want to invite the yeah, audience to give I have, to guess, I have to guess I have an audience in front of me. Yeah, it may, might be able to twitch, turn the camera for a second. Maybe there is nobody there. Let me see. <laughs> okay, there are two people. Good. And it's not much, but in times of Corona, it's all we can do. So, thank you so much, Tiam Funko. Plus, there's another virtual audience. Hi, everybody in Rotterdam, in Lantaren. Hello, Flensburg, Rotterdam. Watching as well. Hello, Rotterdam. Uh, live, hello, Rotterdam. Hello, Amsterdam. Hello, Gion Funko from Hi. an undisclosed location. Thank you so much. Yeah, for very anonymous, because I, nobody can know where I am now. We won't tell, <laughs> don't worry. So there's a lot of things that we can talk about with this film, because it's obviously a very intense uh, film with a very interesting s subject matter. And, you know, you the kind of films that you make, you put a lot of time and energy in them, a lot of years. So you need to be really committed, I can presume, for the kind of stories you want to tell. So my first question, obviously, would be, why did you choose to make a film about the Middle East region and why did you spend all those years there trying to make Noturno? Well, I'll give you a little brief uh, thing before I answer your questions. Sure. Like, I'm 56, 57, I don't know how old I am now. But in my life, I only made uh, six movies. That's it. That's the only thing I did in my life, <laughs> six films, which took me so many years. And I hate somehow to think about my life being being a uh, rhythm from my movies you know that's yeah. because when i turn it's like the, the only memory i have is about my film and it's not good this but <laughs> what made me that's why now i'm in a disclosure uh, place uh, but what made me do this film was a very very was a very urgency after i did the uh, uh, at sea where yes. uh, the film was taking place in Lampedusa and was uh, telling the story of an island. And this island was uh, somehow a metaphor of Europe uh, because in this island I was never really able to, to encounter and meet uh, and having spending time with the people that were passing by through the island. You know, they were staying there one day, two days and then leaving. So the film I did before was like about the island. And then there was this passage of migrants and uh, people that were so i could see the pain i could see the things and there are i don't know how many people there saw my movie before this and and there were never the occasion to meet and to know what was happening so after this film i felt this very strong urgency and need to cross the world the water myself cross the mediterranean sea and go in the places where somehow i could uh, um understand what was going on uh, from that area where the people were like uh, fleeting from war from disaster from uh, from violence uh, and all of this and uh, this film took three years of my life which was a big commitment as you say like most of my film do <laughs> and, uh, and was a, a, a huge journey and this journey was made in these borders, you know, because that's what is the film about. Border, an existent border, because those borders were borders that were like uh, uh, sketched on, on a map uh, in uh, 1916. And um, somehow they're borders that made, made sense in history. You know, these are like betrayed of history. And, uh, and the border I, I follow up for three years where the border where the new state of ISIS was, uh, was growing. And uh, I started the film when ISIS was somehow getting defeated. And I wanted to see the consequence of all that. You know, what was the impact and what was the, the shock wave that uh, arrived to the people that uh, I was able to encounter? Because when I, when I started the film, uh, I didn't know anything about that area. I still don't know anything about that area. The more time I spend, uh, the less I know. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to do a film that was based more on emotion and not on information, you know, and more on encounter. And that's what the film is about. It's about encounter. And once I spent like eight months um, going around uh, 
without camera and uh, and somehow the film was clearer in my eyes uh, or was clear in my mind uh, the need was immediately to break up the borders you know i know that asked a lot to the audience that's why there's not much people there to <laughs> your films are too difficult no <laughs> not too difficult. i ask a lot to the audience so i thank so much the people that resist to that because i want the audience to somehow go through the same journey i was you know to this frame and follow the encounter that I have accidentally and, and everything happened by accident, but somehow uh, once uh, chance and necessity, you know, uh, there was, I meet these people by chance. And once I met them, they become necessity. They became part of my film and part of my life. And, uh, and once I embrace all this story that you see in the movie, that's when I decide to, okay, I can film that. And to film that, it took like, uh, it was very painful three years of my life. I can imagine. For the audience already, if they have questions, feel free to raise them, if we raise your arm, and I can repeat them in the microphone so Gianfranco can also hear them. In the meantime, I might maybe have another follow-up question because you were talking about Fire at Sea, your previous film, Fukamara, taking place in Lampedusa. Obviously, there you have the luxury of being able to share the language of the people that live originally in Lampedusa. Um, what was the, that experience like for you with Notorno? Because you, you say you don't really know anything about the region and you still don't know anything truly. What's that experience like for you as a filmmaker and how does that not knowing shape the film? You know, it was incredible because when I was filming, 99.9% of the time I didn't know what I was filming. <laughs> except that i mean i knew that it was an enormous amount of things coming to me but i didn't know what people were saying most of the time uh, that's why somehow this is also a film of silence you know it's a film of suspension it's a film that reflects also my state of mind when i was there and um, um, i always realized much 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 later what uh, people were saying but when i knew that when i was filming it was so I knew that something was coming from there, you know. You know, sometimes people say, oh, this is a film that's been written. <laughs> this is like, this is a film that's completely improvised, you know, in everything that there is there. And the only incredible thing that I put there was time and trust, you know, to build a trust with uh, all of the people that are there. That was the biggest moment. I did that when I was without the camera, because in my eight months that I was there uh, join, going around and meeting people and talking to people, I didn't have the camera. Uh, I was not able to, to shoot any picture. I, was not, I just had like a notebook where I was scratching a few notes, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, notes that I, I love in paper like that. It's just, and then somehow I knew that this was the, the journey. And, and how did I gain the trust? I think when I went back to them, when I, when I met them and I spent some time, they said, I will be back here, we'll be back here, we'll be back here. And nobody believed me, you know, because how many people they meet and they say, I will be back and make a movie about your condition, your things. And every time when I went back, I was embraced completely. Yeah. And that was trust. The fact that I was able to go back and the fact that all the people I say, I'm going to be back and film, I did it. And that was the moment where trust was created there. And once I had trust, I was able to spend with all of, the, all of them, you know, which are part of my life, uh, from Ali to Mortada to the, to the people in the psychiatric hospital. Once I say, I'm going to be back, and once I went back, the door were completely open and I was able really to spend as much time in, as I wanted there and, uh, and created a, a strong relationship. I can imagine because I can also imagine, I'll get to you after this, I can also imagine that, uh, you know, many news agencies come to these areas of conflict, they film some explosions, some rubble, some people that are devastated and then they leave Definitely, it's very exploited in some way as well to come as a Western cameraman, shoot some horrible war images and leave forever. So Yeah, and then there is another dark story because then I, I always thought that, you know, The Guardian wrote uh, uh, with Focamara, here they wrote, Focamara starts when the, 
the reporter stop. Yeah. You know? And then for me is the moment where I put the language of cinema there. But then, you know, also so, so I have like, you know, the film is going extremely well everywhere. It's going, I cannot complain about how the film is going. But then there is still a little comment in the darkness on my film that they say, oh, the film is aesthetizing it. Yeah. It's like, ah, you aesthetize the pain, the thing. And, and this is something that I'm fighting completely, you know, because it's not about being aesthetizing, it's about finding the splendor of the of the reality that you have in front of you and finding that language that uh, from Yuri Evans, your fantastic, uh, which is a master for me, from Rossellini, from De Seta, from um, Flaherty, putting a camera there makes, means making choices and means using the language of cinema. And that's yeah, what I'm fighting from my first, first film, you know, from Boatman. I always try to do that, using the language of cinema with awareness of what I have in front of me is the heaviness and of life. Mm. And then where is the difference between documentary and uh, fiction? Isn't it, for me, it's not important that. Not because I always say my film, um, you know, by the way, today I have a fantastic news that our film uh, was uh, in the final um, at the nomination British nomination at the British uh, Independent Award. And it's the only documentary there, <laughs> you know? But for me, it's fine because all my life I fight, fought against that, you know, because for me, yeah. there's no difference between documentary and fiction. What is the difference that is important? Is that what is true and what is false? That is what is important. And that's from a book, from a things. Uh, I have a book under here. This is a fantastic book that I'm reading now. And this is, is it Don't true? Don't go to side. <laughs> no, it's a holiday, the computer. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the level of the computer. But when I read this book that I, he I have here in front of me, is, is it true or is it false? I don't care if, if it's like a romance. It's like, right, you know, Kapuczynski was a fantastic, uh, I wrote this today, Kapuczynski. Yeah. Kapuczynski has been one of the great, 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 great uh, analysis of what's happening in the world. He did war, he did everything. So it's like asking to someone like Kapuczynski, why don't you write uh, in a more colloquial way? Why don't you write in a more, so your, you, the way you write is too close to uh, fiction. It's not close to reality. Nobody asks that. But then in, in documentary, the moment you put a frame and you compose a frame became uh, becomes aesthetic, becomes, and it's not true. And They're afraid of your manipulation, but it's a but, diff but, difficult but conversation. Listen, we all, the biggest manipulator in the world of documentary, I don't want to say the name, but we know who he is. <laughs> I think who? we can all you take tell the name, who? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. I know <laughs> there's somebody in their audience that had a but question. That's, and that's the documentary, it seems to be like an observation of the very truth. And for me, it doesn't exist the, the truthfulness in what is the, what is cinema du réel? I hate that word. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, uh, observational cinema? I hate that word. What is, uh, it's not, it, for me, is cinema, no matter what is cinema. And this we learn from flirty, from people that when they put the camera down, they were telling a story. And that's what is important, to tell a story. And now what is important is to transform something something else you know because we have so much information right now that who cares to know all the detail that i don't even have in my mind after three years i spend there i would need a herzog voiceover throughout my feet to explain everything you know <laughs> but unfortunately i'm not herzog so i'm not able no. to explain so i have to fulfill the silent i have that uh, uh, that frame has to be the frame of the mind, it has to be the frame that with the silent, you have 100,000 of, of answer. And with no question or answer, I'm sure if you have the patience to go through this film to the end, you have all the answer you want from the face of Ali. Mm, yeah. It's, it's the language of silence, it's, or, or from the horse. You know, yes, the horse. Of yeah, there's a question in the audience. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I will repeat it. I'm not sure if you can catch it. Go 
Mm-hmm. know that chance is very important to do. Mm-hmm. I know this, but once you um, start a dialogue with people that might end up being your protagonists, yeah. what kind of story is he telling them so that they would like to participate? That's a good question. He is going to bring into the world and um, is, he, uh, is he somehow illustrating them uh, Horizon, like what the film is going to look like. And All right. What intentions are, so why is it important for them to... Exactly. Start? Okay, I think I can recap this. So it's a question from a professional documentary photographer and filmmaker who's wondering about the, the idea of trust, right? Uh, basically, the question comes down to when you meet people, it's a chance encounter, um, but how do you present yourself and how do you present what you want to do with the film when you try to gain their trust and they become protagonists in your film. So not how are you going to capture them, but how do you present yourself and how does that influence? It's very embarrassing for me to present myself, you know, when I'm there. Because of course I have a film that I don't even know. (laughs) It was very funny. I was getting some permission to, to film in the Kurdistan area. It was a war area. And then finally I got to this top, 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 top person to say, okay, you can film there or not. And then she asked me, she was a big, and she said, what your film is about? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I cannot answer to this question. I never did. I was never able to answer to what my film is about. That's why I always say that writing documentary is starting with a lie. And so you have to present, when you write a 50 pages script, you know, this is like now this, when you make a film for Netflix or the, you have to write like a huge script, book. And I'm not able to do that. I was never able to write my movies. I'm able to write three, four, five, six pages, which is a synthesis of something. So when I meet them, I say, I'm making a film. I don't know what film I'm making. And usually I, 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 there is something about on, on that encounter that is beyond my film. Because when I encounter these people, I don't have a camera with me. I'm not there with the crew. I'm with two people. I was there, usually I'm alone, but there I was with two, with my sister and me. And my sister was a driver, was a, thief, was a translator. So I, I, don't even, I don't even talk about the film. I'm more just interested to, to listen, to listen, to listen. I say, I'm making a film and people just talk. And then you start like engaging with that. And what is important for me is to understand what was the moment that engaged me in this? Uh, for example, you know that scene of the uh, with the scooter, the guy with the scooter, the hunter, right? That scene was I was coming from 15 hours drive from Baghdad to the south of Iraq. We went through 20 checkpoints, and every time was a problem. Was a problem. It was very late in the afternoon, and I was like sitting like this and completely dead. And then I was watching the street and then I see this face, this guy on a motorcycle. And I asked by, to Salam, uh, it's not even my sister, Salam was like everything for me. It was like my collaborator, my things, was my mentor. Then I said, who is he? And he said, I'm a hunter. Oh, let's go, let's go back and talk to him. And, and then, go back and talk to him. And then he told me this incredible story that he's hunting in this place. He was fighting ISIS before. Huge story, huge. You could make 30 hours documentary on his life. <laughs> and uh, and then I meet him and he stay, well, 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 you're hunting, while well, you hunt, well, I, I go in this place with fire and everything is red. So the bird arrived and, and then I'm able to shoot at the bird and imagine this incredible scene. And I spent with him two days there. And then I told him, I will be back and meeting you. When I went back, he didn't care about me, which film I was making with him. The thing was like, I was back, I was there, 
I was sleeping in his house. We were together and together we started this journey. I didn't know what I was going to feel with him. I spent one month there risking three times to be kidnapped. <laughs> and what I was, wanted to film in him looking at these birds. And when I arrived there, there were no birds anymore. Mm -hmm. So what he does is just looking around and waiting, waiting for these birds, which is somehow the sense of the film, the sense yeah. of waiting. So I never had the story in front of me. I understand the story when I have a frame, look inside and boom, then I say, okay, this is a little bit of my story. This is another bit of my story. This is another bit of, and I spent three years like that. When I got to the editing, is a different, different challenge. Challenge, because I film eighty hours, and these eighty hours has to be in this ninety minutes film. Yeah. But I understand most of the time that my work is about missing things. It's about. It's not about gaining or making more, more, more things. It's about missing things constantly. When I put one frame and waiting for days, days there that this frame has a story, I miss everything that is around me. I'm, there are like millions, millions of people in Middle East and my film is about eight, eight stories, a very, very small story. But what is important that every of these story has an incredible wave of, is like an archetype, has a universality. And this is my duty to capture that moment in this life that I met randomly to capture the truth in their life and say, okay, this is exactly him. This is what he does. This is Ali, this is Mortara, because I know that this is his life. And when they see the film, they recognize themselves. They say, oh, this is really me. But for me, Mortara is him waiting. Mortara is him like going into the darkness. Ali is a silence. Um, the mother, I didn't expect that to happen in front of my camera when there was this morning there. I was just look for a place where the, the mother for the, after 30 years, they went into this jail and they find a room where, where the, 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 son was the, the, the son was killed. Yeah. And uh, I put the camera there and said, this is chanting. I don't understand what's happening there, but I filmed that. I understood that three years later on the editing the importance of that chant. And that's a universal, is a universal pain, you know? That's when I understood that pain. That's why that scene is at the beginning of the movie, because uh, the pain of a mother that loses a, a son or, or of a father or of a, of a mother lose a son is, there's no border on that. No. It's a universal pain. Like Ali has no border. For me, it's not important that Ali is from Syria from Iraq, from thing is is one kid that is 12 years old, 13 years old, and he's sustaining the family, and this is not right. So my film is political in the choice when I say this is not right. Mm. Are there still any questions in the audience? Still some people thinking about one. Well, if you're talking about choices and characters, I am wondering about this incredible scene shot in this prison with all the ISIS fighters. I presume they're ISIS fighters. Yeah, they are ISIS, of course. Yeah. Can you talk about, I mean, it's like hundreds of lives in one shot. Can you talk about how you got there, what that experience was like? Because it's very uh, incredible to see as well. So how do you get that access and how, why did you include the that? Access, like every single frame in the film is because I have incredible produ line producers there and producer of the film. Um, I have people that again, trust. I had to trust them, they had to trust me. They put my safety around. It's like, because yeah. everywhere you go, there's no safe there. So I had to trust. They were organizing things. They were organizing my thing, my journey, how I, could, I was able to move. And, uh, and when I was in, uh, in Syria um, with uh, Guevara, who was the line producer there, and uh, I have to thank uh, Orwa for this uh, because she, he put me in touch with her. The director of IFA, yeah. The director of IFA, yeah, he's from Syria. And he was an incredible, to have him as a producer of the film was fantastic because he gave me so much uh, input, you know, into the film. 
And uh, then it, when I went there, I didn't know again what to feel. I went there because there was this incredible conflict happening between Turkey and Syria. They were arriving in the Kurdistan area. And I spent like weeks, 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 weeks there trying to understand this conflict. But when you are in the conflict area, war is very boring, you know? It's like shoot, 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 boom, silence for three weeks. Shoot, 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 silence for three weeks. I said, I'm not interested to shoot, to film that. What I'm interested to shoot is what this war has a consequence. And, um, and when I was there, I went again, one month, two months we spent there. And then so she said, oh, there is this ISIS prison um, um, that maybe we can get the permit. It took like three, four, five weeks to take a permit. Arrived in this prison and, um, and the director of the prison said, okay, you have the permit, you can shoot. So I go with my camera in my shoulder like this, and I, he's, I spend the whole day with him around this thing, he's explaining everything. And at the end of this day, he say, but why are you here, you're not shooting? <laughs> I said, well, because I have to understand what's happening. So again, I spend their days in this place. I understood that the incredible things that these people from the ISIS, that there was the last, last, last fight they did, uh, and um, was a, the last uh, combat that there was, and they were all taken prisoners in this uh, in, in this place. And uh, I said, what did they do? Well, they spent like two weeks in this room, and once every two weeks they can go out, mm. and then they come back in the dark. Mm. This is completely against any human rights. Yeah. No matter who you have in front of you, no human being can be treated like that. No. But in the film, I don't want, I don't say that, but it's very evident. Yeah, something is happening, yeah. Something is happening, and something is happening that is again the not responsibility from European community, from things to take care of. Okay, these are prisoners of war. What do we do with them? Yeah. They cannot afford by putting them in a room where 250 people were in that room, squeezed. And I don't want to feel sorry for them because they committed the worst, worst crime. But somehow that is a description of what's happening in their life right now. And to put that scene after the kids, it was a very, very um, challenging choice, you know, because yeah. that scene was out many times and then put in, put, I didn't know where to put that scene. And then I didn't know if to put the scene of the kids in the room, because that is another film. So the challenge of this film is always to find the synthesis, you know, yeah. something that is so peculiar that you can go from one thing to another thing to another thing. And of course, in between you lose a lot, you know, because to go from the kids to the eyes and then back to another story, I demand a lot to the audience. But I think all this has a very specific uh, itinerary which was my experience basically when I was there. And I hope that I can transfer that to the audience when they watch the movie. Ozzy, I think we have to wrap up. So I'm gonna ask a quick final question. You make, you work years on your documentaries. Is there already something that the audience can expect of you or are you now trying to get rid of Notturno and reset a little no, bit? No, I have to get rid of Notturno. Notturno now has been nominated from Italy to represent it, uh, which is a yeah. lot. Academy Awards. I kind of, uh, to have a documentary running as a, as a thing is, is a very special, is a huge honor uh, for me. So I have to go through this. And then what I want to do is like working with students and, uh, and uh, go back uh, to, I would like to, to spend time now working with students and uh, spend some time. I have no idea what's going to be. I, you know, I think with this film, I push really the limit of my work, of my method somehow, from Boatman to this film. And now I need time to see how I'm gonna watch now reality. And it's getting more complicated, complicated, complicated to put a frame and to watch reality. And, and, and I think the duty of the documentaries is to find the challenge always to experiment because with no experiment, experimentation, there's no documentary. Now documentary for me has an incredible, um, um, Bridge and incredible, how to say, layers of uh, experimentation, and that's what I love about documentary. And uh, but this film, I think, I really, really pushed the the limit, and um, I have to go back uh, and see how I'm gonna be able 
after only six films I made to be able to watch and to tell another story because uh, you know for me it's not about making film it's about challenging myself on how to tell a story and still with the awareness that what you have in front of you is reality you know is the is the the splendor of reality and uh, and the enigma of history always you got some good reflecting to do <laughs> thank you so much Dion Franco for your time for your thank answers you. for your stories for Noturno uh, I think it's time for applause hey, you now. Know what? if you can hear it <laughs> you know what you're one of the can you still hear me yes you're one of the two three country in the world that he's that still have this magic of watching a film in a big screen so I want to applaud the, the, the courage of your politician that are able to open the theaters. In Italy, the theaters are closed down since months, months and months. And you know, you know, cinema is not like you have like 20,000 people going to the, the cinema like it's like a concert. There are eight, nine, 10 people go to see a movie. So I don't understand why closing a, a movie theater yeah. because not when things lucky. happen. It's not where the virus is contagious. Just wear your mask, that's it. We have one. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Jim Franco. We're very lucky. We're very lucky to have had you okay. here. Also in Rotterdam. Thank you, so Thank you Lontaro Fenster. Oh, really? Thank you for having this. Uh, if there were 10 people there, I'm so happy that we're able to see the movie in the big screen. So really, Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Good luck, Jim Franco. Oh. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Thank you.